Our Bible word is 1 Corinthians 13 verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. First, the context of 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote this from Ephesus. If you look there in chapter 16 verses 8. This is where Paul writes the epistle from. And he was on his third missionary journey. And this took place between 53 to 57. And you can read about it in Acts 18 to Acts 21. So 1 Corinthians was written somewhere between 53 to 55 AD. And Paul found himself or established this congregation in Corinth. Of course, Corinth is situated in Achaia. That's a province situated today in southern Greece. Or oh, it was back then, it was known as also as Achaia. And Paul established the congregation during his second missionary journey. And his second missionary journey took place between 50 to 52 AD. And that you can read about in Acts 15 to Acts 18 verses 23. And during his second missionary journey, he came, Paul came to Corinth from Athens. This is also the place where he met Aquila and Priscilla. And when Paul arrived in Corinth, he converted the ruler of the synagogue, that is Crispus. And he's also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 14 and Acts 18 verse 18. And Paul, yeah, stayed in Corinth for 18 months. And it's also at this time that he was brought before Gallio. He was, he was the, the Roman proconsul there in Corinth and where he was trial or put on trial, etc. And also the, the Jews in Corinth, they beat Sosthenes. He was the ruler of the synagogue. And, but he's also Paul's co-author of this epistle. If you go to chapter 1, verses 1, Sosthenes is mentioned there as a co-writer of Paul. And, of course, also associated with Corinth is the figure of Apollos. Apollos also came to Corinth and... It's also mentioned quite frequently in 1 Corinthians. Yet also there's a portion that was the Apollos faction. Apollos, he was a very eloquent speaker, apparently, if you go read there, also in Acts 18. And compared to Paul, he was a very good speaker. He was eloquent. Some didn't like Paul because he wasn't a very good speaker. So now after Paul... Of course, he established the congregation, he moved on, he's now on his third missionary journey, so he heard of issues facing the congregation. It was a, of course, it's a congregation coming from a pagan environment. Corinth itself, it had a reputation for its immorality. And so, in the congregation in Corinth, they were spiritually immature. And they were still tainted by immorality. And many problems that were facing this young community. So Paul had many headaches that he had to deal with in Corinth. And so after his greeting, Paul turns to these problems that, that needs to be addressed. And there's many two sections of the epistle. The first section deals with news that he re received from Chloe's people. And that's re referenced to in chapter 1 verses 11. And then the sec second thing, that Paul deals with questions that were asked to him in a letter that they wrote to him. And that we find reference to in 7 verses 1. Now, of course, if you go to the news from Chloe's people, and th this probably refers to Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. And Paul actually mentioned them in chapter 16. And he says, He's come, they've come here to me to... Visit me here in Ephesus. Ephesus, that was where Paul wrote the letter from. And the news from Chloe's people, Paul hears, there's divisions among you. Some say, I'm from Apollos, or I of Cephas, or of Christ, or Paul. Divisions. And Paul addresses these divisions. There's also sexual immorality. Paul actually earlier, if you go read there in chapter 5, verses 9. Paul actually wrote a previous letter, which is now 
lost to us. It's, Paul writes there, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. So, what the, else this letter says we do not know, but obviously this problem was not resolved. Because part of the problem in Corinth is sexual immorality. Especially some who opposed Paul, they were also associated with a spiritual elitism. I will speak about that now. But they also followed the slogan in terms of all things are lawful for me, or all things are permitted for me. Somehow deeds committed in the body uh, does not count. And Paul says, no, <laughs> this is not the case. So he also addresses them. Also, it's lawsuits. See, yes, they are taking each other to court. And Paul says, how can you take each other to court? You are followers of Christ. Then there's a spiritual elitism. Like I said, some who opposed Paul, they didn't like his, the way he spoke. They thought he wasn't a good speaker. They didn't follow him. They didn't like him or whatever. And they were also very impressed with his spiritual gifts. It appears that speaking in tongues here, proved to be a real problem and they were very proud of their ability to speak in tongues and also combined with that thing all things are permitted for me whatever they just thought that they were absolutely great they were already, ru already ruling etc this is what, what Paul writes to them in, in chapter 4 verses 8 you are already full you are already rich you have reigned as kings without us and indeed I could wish you did reign that we might also reign with you. So Paul addresses these guys who are boasting, who think that they are so spiritually fantastic, endowed with gifts, especially it would appear speaking in tongues. And Paul addresses them also. And of course, some question Paul's authority. Why must we listen to Paul? If we have all these questions or problems, why not Apollos or, or Cephas, that's Peter or whatever? Why Paul? So Paul must also address his authority in terms of, I'm an apostle, I've, I'm authorized to address this. So that's the news Paul heard from Chloe's people. And then questions, they addressed him questions. In chapter 7 is about virginity and marriage. Can we get married? Yes, no. And Paul actually says, yeah, it's better if you remain unmarried and also celibate, like in view of coming of the Lord. Let your focus be on the Lord. But he also says, if you want to get married, you, you can't help yourself, get married. Then also food offered to idols. Can you eat food offered to idols? Some asked, because that was part and parcel of pagan God worship. And... Food was sacrificed to idols and then people also have feasts to eat the meat. And these feasts, they would also go ahead, go along with all kinds of other sins committed, etc. And Paul says, well, r rather not eat this meat to idols. We know these idols are nothing. They don't exist, but let's not cause offense to the weaker person. So rather abstain from eating meat sacrificed to idols. And of course, in chapter 11, Paul addresses the Lord's Supper. There was abuse of the Lord's Supper. Some people come there, they eat their food. Others come there, they have nothing to eat. And again, it's about part and parcel of this congregation was class division. Like the, those who have versus the have-nots. Because if you read the epistle, you can see people like come there from all kinds of social backgrounds. And again, Paul emphasizes... This is not what the Lord's Supper is about. We are there for each other. And do not disgrace the Lord's Supper and abuse it. And the use of spiritual gifts, that's in chapters 12 to 14. And it's about, again, it's about we exist for each other in terms of the use of the spiritual gifts. Uh, the Holy Spirit has endowed people with spiritual gifts. And he also addresses this issue of speaking in tongues, etc., and he actually relegates them to the bottom of the list. They're, they're the least important. Like he says in chapter 14, rather seek to prophecy. Chapter 13, he says, love must be the driving force behind whatever we do. And of course, in chapter 12, it's, he addresses these gifts, that the Spirit has given people different gifts 
to build up, to edify the church, to build up each other. And in chapter 15, where there are those who denied the resurrection of the body, and Paul says, no, you cannot do this. We believe in the resurrection of the body. And if we do not believe that, then Christ has not risen and our faith is in vain. So these were different issues that Paul addressed to this letter that was addressed to him there. In 7 verses 1, it's briefly mentioned, it says there, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. Then now Paul systematically addresses these different issues. Now in the last chapter, Paul addresses the collection of money for the poor. That was a project he was always involved in to make a collection of money for the poor in Jerusalem that he can also take with him when, when he goes back to Jerusalem. So, so that's the context of 1 Corinthians. Now our immediate textual unit. And of course it's chapters 12 to 14. And that is where Paul speaks specifically about the use of spiritual gifts. Paul explains that there are various gifts, there are gifts of the Spirit, and these gifts are given for mutual edification. And also, believers is like a body, it's interconnected, mutually interdependent, and we are there to support and help one another. And now Paul focuses on the ethical principles of employing the gifts, and that's our most immediate textual unit, and that's from chapter 12, verses 31, to chapter 13, verse 13. And Paul encourages them, seek better gifts. Remember, there were some Corinthians, they boasted, and now they could speak in tongues, and how wonderful they are, and how spiritual they are. And Paul actually relegates tongues to the bottom of the gifts, and he says, seek better gifts, especially to prophecy. If we go there to the end of chapter 12, Paul says, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And now that explains the ethical principles for how to employ the gifts. In our textual unit, we can divide it in the following way. From verses 1 to 3, Paul contrasts between love and gifts. And then from verses 4 to 7, Paul explains what love is. He explains virtues or attributes of love. And then from verses 8 to 13, Paul again makes a contrast between love and gifts. So, the essence here is, is that love is eternal. Last, love will accompany us into the future, into God's kingdom. It will always be there. Gifts are temporary. So they are given now, but let's put things in the proper perspective. Love has priority. That is where everything begins. And if you don't have that right, everything else you do will be wrong. So if we go to verse 1, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have no love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So, Paul mentions here various gifts, especially, of course, he's also speaking to these Corinthians who are so boasting in their abilities, etc. They do, do all these things, but they do it without love. So, Paul is saying, what you're doing, you're, it's a waste. So, even if you're speaking tongues or prophecy, we have knowledge and you have faith and you give all your possessions away. Even if you experience martyrdom, if it's without love, it's worthless. You are sounding brass or a big gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, you just make noise. That's what you do. You make noise. If love is not there, everything you do is nothing. It's just noise. And then in verses 4 to 7, Paul explains the attributes of love, what love actually is. And he says there, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up. It's, not, it's everything that you, the Corinthians, that you are not. 
Because you Corinthians, like some of them, you're boastful and you're arrogant and you're selfish. Now you boast in your gifts and your spiritual, high spiritual level, etc. So Paul is also taking a swipe at them. This is what love is. Love is kind, etc. And does not seek its own. It's not provoked, thinks no evil, etc. This is the attributes of love. And now from verses 8 to 13, Paul again makes a contrast. Yeah, it's, he contrasts future fulfillment where everything will become complete. And where love will still be relevant compared to the present time where things are incomplete. Love never fails, but where, whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So many of these gifts now, tongues, prophecy, knowledge, etc., it's limited. And to a degree, it will become irrelevant because in the future, in God's kingdom, everything will be known in full. That will be a time of fullness, completeness. So, just remember, keep this perspective. Your tongues, your prophecies, etc. It's imperfect. It's incomplete. And then, our Bible word is, And now abide faith, hope, love. These are other great virtues to have. These three. But the greatest of these is love. So, it's because love is eternal. Love is going to last forever, even into eternity. So, this is the relationship between love and gifts. Gifts are subordinate to love. Love is primary. That's where everything begins. And if you have love, then the way you use your gifts in the church will also be done in the right way. It's done for the right reasons.